Okay, so um, thank you very much for all waking up after, I guess many of you I know have jet lag, because I certainly do. Um, <clears throat> so um, everything I'm going to say this morning, I just want to say it now before I forget later, is joint with Bargov Bot and Shinsky Takagi. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about, uh, hof hopefully, uh, sort of three different conjectures. And sort of the goal is to show they're all equivalent. Um, and this is really sort of building on, at least half of it is building on some um, older previous work of Mircea Mustaza and uh, Srinivas. Um, <clears throat> and so let me uh, state a conjecture that was formulated in their paper, although in a stronger form has been around for, for a bit longer. So I'll call this the weak ordinarity conjecture. Oh, this, this is the paper of uh, Mustatsa and Srinivas. Um, I don't know, from maybe two years ago, is that right? Roughly. Okay, so, <clears throat> but I mean, this is a weak version of a stronger, stronger conjecture, which I'll at least verbally state in a moment. So let's let X be a smooth projective variety over C. Um, <clears throat> and let's let Xa may be over A is a is a flat family. I'll say of characteristic P models of X. So here um, A is equal to the spec of some finally generated algebra containing containing the integers. And the idea is, I'm just doing a reduction to characteristic P here, is if I tensor this family up with C, I just get my um, my original X over C. Okay. Well, well A is a finally generated Z, Z algebra, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, roughly speaking, I take whatever coefficients I need to and throw them in A. There you go. Okay, and so then the conjecture is the following, that there exists a Zariski dense set of closed points uh, I'll call them P and A, such that the base change, um, you know, if, if I base change x to that close point, you know, just do the reduction to characteristic p. And I look at the cohomology of the structure sheaf, top cohomology, say. And I apply for Benius that this is bijective. What, you don't look happy, Christian. Did I say something? If you have, for example, an elliptic curve over Q, and uh -huh. it's L keeps the top, it has infinitely many superfluid reductions. Of course. And also has infinitely many ordinary ones. Pardon? It also has infinitely many it's ordinary ones. Infinitely dense. Dense, dense, dense. Zariski dense. Uh, Zariski dense. Yes, absolutely. That, that, that's the key point. <laughs> That's right. So, so that, that, that <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 this is a. <laughs> and this is exactly the point. I mean, and that's the example you should keep in mind. X is an elliptic curve, perhaps, and then you know it, the characteristic p reduction is ordinary if and only if this is bijective, and um, hopefully, pos you know, or, or, you know for some positive density of answers, it is going to be 
bijective. But I'm just asking, even for a weaker statement here, I'm just asking for a Zariski dense set of primes for which this is bijective. Okay. Um, so hopefully the statement is clear. Um, a couple quick comments. In fact, just by doing a couple, some quick chick, some quick uh, cutting by hyperplane sections of your original variety, you can quickly reduce to the case of all the intermediate cohomologies. If you assume the conjecture for all x, then you can actually easily reduce. Th then it implies this conjecture as well. No, I'm actually, I, I'd be, yes, or I'd be cutting x. Y yes, x, either the original x or xa, yeah. Um, and I should also point out that this actually can be done simultaneously for a finite set of x's. If I give you a finite set of x's and by taking some kind of product thing, I can do the same kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> okay. And so this is, this is, this conjecture actually turns out to be um, very closely related to some conjectures you sort of heard sort of briefly mentioned yesterday by Paolo relating things like F regularity and F purity, especially F purity with um, things like log canonical singularity. And so that, that's in some sense what we're going to be talking about today. We'll be talking about how this conjecture is related to how singularities behave under reduction mod P. Okay. Okay, so maybe I should mention again just verbally um, there's not a whole lot of evidence for this conjecture at some level. Um, I guess we know it for, you know, elliptic curves, abelian surfaces, and K3s. And I think that's the extent of our knowledge. And so that's, you know, th that's a pretty small slice of things. I mean, we also know it for things like, I don't know, X is a complete intersection or a hypersurface cut out by sufficiently general polynomials. Um, and things like that. But and then, of course, you know, certain special cases are fine, too. Um, uh, so what do you think? Is that case or what? Huh? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 actually, but are okay, too. Yeah, I was wondering. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, I only mentioned the Calabi out case. Yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right. Fanos are okay, too. Um, but yes, anything, basically anything higher, um, could higher dimension is, is basically, I think, completely open at this point. Okay. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I didn't say it was hard. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Yeah, you know, yes, yes. I mean, any hypersurface you write down is probably you're probably going to be able to work it out if you give an explicit equation. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So like I said, this is a conjecture, although we don't have a ton of evidence for it. And so I'm going to be talking about relating this to a couple other conjectures. The first is a, um, the first conjecture I'm going to talk about involves Dubois singularities. And these haven't been talked about yet, but Chandra will talk about them a lot next. So I'm going to try to say a few, um, <laughs> a few words about them here. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple different definitions. But X is Dubois. I'm going to define Dubois a couple ways, and then I'll give you some ways to think about them if you're not so familiar with them. If for all or some, all right. I'm going to write this in a funny way, so if you don't, if you're not, if you haven't seen this before, this won't make any sense. But I'll give a version that does make sense in just a second. If for all, um, either smooth, depends on how you like to think about this, hypercovers or hyperresolutions, cubic or simplicial, in the sense of Galen's Hodge theory. Um, <clears throat> We have OX to the derived push forward of this structure sheaf here is an isomorphism. OK, so if you haven't seen these things before, 
This x dot is a diagram of schemes. In characteristic zero, you can assume it's a finite diagram of schemes. And somehow this diagram is topologically the same, depending on what exactly you mean the same, but it's, it's topologically the same as x, at least more topologically the same than the resolution here is. It's a hyper-resolution because each scheme in this diagram of schemes is smooth. And, and then what you do is when you push this r pi dot lower star, depending on exactly how you're thinking of it, um, this, is some, this is some complex in the bounded derived category with coherent cohomology. And I don't know, I mean, one way to think of it is you push down all the schemes here and you limit them or inverse limit them together in some appropriate derived way, say. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you another definition in just a second. Um, <clears throat> so, so, by the way, this is all in characteristic zero, at least for now. We're going to start in characteristic zero. Okay, so here's another definition. Let's say x is a subset of y, which is smooth. Um, <clears throat> y prime to y is a resolution. Is a log resolution of y comma x. So x is just a subscheme. And so I'm going to let E denote the inverse image of x with the reduced scheme structure. So this is just probably an exceptional divisor, unless x happens to be a hypersurface, in which case it's it's a, it's, a, it's the total transform of x, regardless. Um, and then it turns out that this r pi dot lower star of ox dot, of ox dot, that this is just isomorphic in the derived category to r pi, this pi lower star of the structure sheaf of e. And so this is kind of like a resolution of singularities. Let's imagine that x actually was a hypersurface. E has the resolution of singularities in it, but it also has some other exceptional components. And if you push all those down together, you get, it turns out you get this isomorphism right here. OK. Um, and, it, and of course, it turns out that, you know, or at least for obvious reasons, there's a natural map from Ox to this guy. And that's the same map as this one right here. And so this is. This map is a quasi-isomorphism if and only if this is a quasi-isomorphism. So if you want, you can define x to be Dubois if for any embedding of x into some smooth guy, you take this exceptional, you take a log resolution, um, you look at E, the exceptional set, and you require that Ox mapping to this guy is, is an isomorphism. OK. Um, but back to your original, I guess you're, you had a question how this how this is like a resolution. It turns out that one of the components here is, is the resolution of singularities, but there's other components too, which you know maybe even fit together in some way like that. Not so far. OK. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So if you, have, I'm going, if you haven't seen this before, maybe I should tell you, instead of just telling you this definition, I should tell you how to think of it. So again, hopefully we all remember what the weak ordinarity conjecture says. Um, <clears throat> so I want to tell you how Dubois singularities relate to um, the singularities you've already heard people talk about a lot, log terminal, log canonical, you know, the singularities of the minimal model program. Maybe I'll leave this part up just to remind you that, this, that the Frobenius here is, is what we're going to care about. OK. So <clears throat> we all know that log terminal singularities, I'll, I'll draw my favorite diagram here. Log terminal singularities are log canonical. And in fact, they're even semi-log canonical, whatever that means. It's some kind of non-normal version of log canonical. And it's been known for a long time that log terminal singularities are also rational. 
And it turns out the rational singularities are Dubois, and semi-log canonical singularities are Dubois, although some of these things are hard. I mean, as far as I know, semi-log canonical implies Dubois. The only proof I know of still uses the MMP, for instance. So um, this, is actually, this is actually a hard implication, whereas log terminal irrational isn't that hard. It's an easy application of Kalamata Fifek vanishing. Um, rational implies Dubois. This was first proven by, so, so this hard direction was proven by Shandor, uh, Kovac, and Janos Kolar. This direction was proved by Shandor, Kovac, and also independently by Morihiko Saito. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a, a couple of other arrows I can draw here. If I add the Gorenstein condition, then Dubois implies semi-log canonical. And if I add the Gorenstein condition up here, then rational implies log terminal. And I think all of these sort of analogies you could imagine coming out of this diagram are correct. So what do I mean by that? I mean things like log terminal is to rational as log canonical is to Dubois. And I think that's a, that's a reasonable statement. Um, and I think completely true. And log terminal is to, say, semi-log canonical, as rational is to Dubois as well. Um, and so if you have any kind of idea of like maybe semi-log canonical is some kind of limiting case of log terminal, then you should also view, likewise view Dubois as some kind of limiting case of rational and so forth. OK. Um, <clears throat> And so what I want to do is I want to, I want to relate this um, notion of Dubois singularities to something in characteristic P. And before I do that, let me give you one other definition of Dubois singularity. And this is sort of a local cohomology version of Dubois singularities, which actually really first appeared, um, I think, in some sense, in Chandor's proof that rational singularities are Dubois, or at least a weak form of it did. OK. So here's a fact. Um, Kovac, or maybe Kovac and myself. Okay. Um, <clears throat> X is Dubois if and only if for all Z inside X closed points. The local cohomology map of the structure sheaf, which maps somehow to the local hypercohomology of this guy that I just erased. So this is the r pi dot lower star o x dot, which is frequently written like that. Um, so remember, we had this map from OX to this guy. And Dubois meant that this map was an isomorphism. And it turned out that this is enough to check that the, this map for at local cohomology of all closed points is um, injective. Okay. Um, so actually, um, when Chandra was proving that rational implied Dubois, sort of the key argument was that if Z was, the iso was an isomorphism, an isolated point of the non-Dubois locus, then um, X was Dubois if and only if this injective. And so, so, so this has actually had a pretty long you know, history in some sense. But it's actually true even for non-isolated points as well. It turns out that this map is always surjective, period. And so it's easy to see that if it's injective at all closed points, it's an isomorphism at all closed points, which proves that these two complexes are isomorphic by some Grodendieck duality type statements. OK. So this is the fact I want you to consider. And then I want you to consider the characteristic P 
analog of Dubois singularities, which uses Frobenius instead of a resolution, or in this case, hyper-resolution, or hyper smooth hypercover. So now we're going to switch over to characteristic P. And here's the definition. X is F injective. If for all Z and X closed points, I'm going to assume that the base field is algebraically closed for simplicity. Um, otherwise, maybe I need to deal with non-closed points as well. Then HI Z XOX to HI Z XOX. And instead of doing a hyper-resolution here, I'm just going to do the Frobenius. So X is F injective if for all closed points this map is injective. Okay. <clears throat> and and this, 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 is a, this is a class of singularities which was actually defined independently from Dubois singularities. They were actually both defined approximately the same year in the early 1980s um, um, for different reasons. Actually, F injective was defined because people observed that F purity, which if you'll remember from Paolo's talk, was some kind of analog of log canonical singularities. They observed that log, this F, these F-pure singularities didn't deform in families very well when the, um, when the total space was like not Q Gorenstein. And they wanted something that did deform better in families. And, they, and Richard Fetter, a student of Mel Hoxter, sort of in the pre-tight closure school of commutative algebra, stumbled on this definition and thought it deformed somewhat better in families um, than, um, than F-purity, the analog of log canonical. And so, so this has been around for quite a while. And I, what I want to do is I want to try to tell you that these two things are closely related. So F injective is somehow the right analog of Dubois. OK, so before I get to this relation relating these two definitions with what's left of the weak ordinarity conjecture up there. Yes, it does. This is uh, the, 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 yes. Um, Chandra will tell you all about this next talk. Um, no, that map is basically never surjective. It, it, it's, yeah, it's definitely not obvious. And I don't know if you're going to tell, tell people the history or not. Yes. No. OK. I claim to have proven that in is to tell you some theorem um, relating F injective and Dubois and tell you how it's related to this weak ordinarity conjecture over there. But first, I'd like to say a little bit more about the connection. Because these two definitions look really similar, right? I mean, almost. <laughs> it, you know, if you squint really hard and, and replace this hyper-resolution with a Frobenius map, and actually, actually, that's exactly what I'm going to tell you now, that hyper-resolutions and Frobenius are the same thing somehow in characteristic P, roughly. Yeah, OK. So this, this is a theorem, or really an observation of Gabber. And it's unpublished. Um, but <laughs> um, it, it, it's written up in, the, in our joint work with uh, Bargov and Shunsky Takagi. Um, and so here's what it says. It tells you that the limit over all, say, smooth hypercovers, and even though we don't have resolution of singularities, we actually do have smooth hypercovers in characteristic P using alterations. And you know, you can say that two hypercovers dom you know, one hypercover dominates, so you can form some kind of system of these things. 
And if you take the derived direct image of these smooth hypercovers, um, <clears throat> then it turns out that what you get is you get Ox to the 1 over P to the infinity. Characteristic P. Everything's characteristic P now. But hypercover still exists as an alteration. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So this is characteristic. OK, so <clears throat> what do I mean by this? This is like extracting infinite roots from OX. It's like an infinite Frobenius. And so somehow the limit over all smooth hypercovers is exactly the same as um, it's exactly the same as taking a lot of Frobenia. And in fact, it immediately follows. Oh, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, OK. So OX to the 1 over P as an OX module, this is all the pth roots of the sections of OX. And so it's exactly the same thing as the Frobenius push forward of OX as a module. Ox to the 1 over p squared is the second Frobenius push forward. Ox to the 1 over p to the infinity means take all the, uh, yet, yes, yeah, it's, it's the direct limit of all these things. And so it's a convenient way to write this. Some people just write Ox to the infinity, too, depending on exactly where, what school of thought you're coming from. Nothing. A scheme, well, why don't, we, why don't we be careful? A scheme of finite type over some, I don't know, perfect field of characteristic p or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't need algebraically closed. But I, I'm just, let's assume algebraically closed so, so we don't confuse ourselves about it. But no, I just need perfect. What? Yeah, my field, my, my field isn't always perfect in, in the paper, but for this talk, my field is always perfect. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the rank goes up. I said the rank of this. Well, no, 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 so, 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 so somehow in characteristic zero, even if I take a hypercover involving alterations, I, only, I always get this one thing out. There's only one, I mean, any of these push forwards are the same. So in characteristic zero, there's just one limit. You know, the, the limit's very boring. In characteristic P, the limit's much more interesting. Um, and basically the point is, I mean, these hypercovers I said are sort of supposed to like preserve the topological structure of my variety. And Frobenius also preserves the topological structure of my variety. And actually, that's exactly what's going on here. Because if I take one hypercover, I can Frobeniate that. I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> I can Frobeniate that cover, and um, that gives me a new cover. And I can Frobeniate it again until, um, I, until I get, you know, yeah. Um, and so that's exactly the point somehow. It turns out that the cohomology of, this, of one of these hypercovers, the higher cohomology, is killed by, uh, and any class of the higher cohomology of this is killed by some appropriate Frobenius. And that's exactly where you get this thing. Out of. That's exactly where you, where you get this. And so somehow, all the higher cohomology goes away in the limit, and you're just left with um, the zeroth piece where I can Frobeniate away until I'm, until, I'm, uh, until I'm left with Ox to the, one over, to the 1 over p to the infinity, all the p roots. OK, so this actually is really pretty good because this tells me, so then we observe that x is f injective. This is just a trivial consequence of, of not what, well, yes, basically it's an easy consequence of Gabber's observation that x is f injective if and only if H i z x o x to this hypercohomology. So exactly the same statement as we had in characteristic zero. X r pi lower star o x dot. If and only if this is injective for all x dot two x these smooth hypercovers. So x is f injective if and only if this map injects, which is exactly the same definition we had in characteristic zero. And, and, the, and the point is, hypercovers are the same as Frobenia, somehow, at least in the limit. I mean, roughly speaking, 
I mean, how do you do this? If, if one Frobenius is injective, then doing Frobenius twice is just the composition of two Frobenius, which is injective. And so the limit is injective. And so that means you know, each piece in this limit is also injective for the same reason. That's the proof. OK. <coughs> All right, so I still left a little bit of this conjecture left. All right, so what I want to talk about now is the relation between this ordinarity conjecture and Dubois and F injective singularity. So hopefully I've convinced you that F injective and Dubois singularities are the same at this point. And so now I'm going to tell you they're also the same after reduction, the characteristic P modulo this weak ordinarity conjecture. So here's another conjecture. I'll call this one conjecture, I don't know, B. <coughs> Um, oops, I lost the page here. Say I have some variety over the complex numbers. Um, XA over A as before. Some family. Reduction mod P. And then, then the statement is that X is Dubois. If and only if x mod p is, if inject, is f injective for a Zariski dense set of p inside a. Close point. Okay, so this is the conjecture b. So this says that. Um, X is Dubois if and only if the mod P reduction is F injective for a dense set. Now, you cannot expect this to be hold true for an open set. Um, <clears throat> because exactly of the case of the cone over an elliptic curve. The cone over an elliptic curve well, is always Dubois, say the, cone, the planar cone over an elliptic curve. But it's F injective if and only if um, it's, you know, the, the elliptic curve is ordinary. And so the best we can expect is for this to be true on a dense set. Um, and so the theorem that myself, Bargov, Bot, and Shinsky Takagi proved is that, and this is actually not so hard either, a weak ordinarity is equivalent to. Um, the weak ordinarity conjecture is equivalent to conjecture B. Okay. So by the way, maybe I should make a quick comment about conjecture B. One direction is, all, is, is, is known, and the other direction is the conjectural part of it. If xp is f injective for a dense set of primes, then x is Dubois. I guess this is essentially my thesis. Um, and actually, the way I proved it somehow was I took a particular um, resolution or hyper-resolution characteristic zero and I proved that the cohomology of that particular resolution when I reduced it to characteristic P died. I mean, under Frobenius. So Frobenius killed these things. Um, so F, XPF injective implies that X is Dubois. And the, the actual content of conjecture B is that if X is Dubois, then after I reduce it to characteristic P, it, is f, f injective for infinitely many p for a dense set of p. And so what we prove right here is that ordinarity is equivalent to conjecture b. Now it turns out that conjecture b is actually easily seen to imply weak ordinarity by taking cones over smooth varieties, basically. Uh, if you take a cone over a smooth variety um, and you take a high Veronese, then that cone is actually always going to be Dubois. 
So this is a little bit different than log canonical, because if I take a high Veronese of a, of a cone, it's log canonical. That's, that's going to mean basically something, you know, th this is, as Paolo was saying, this implies some kind of log calabial type statement about the original variety. Dubois is a much weaker condition. Any variety, if I take a high enough Veronese, is Dubois on the cone. And so if it's F injective on that high Veronese, well, that just means that the Frobenius map is injective right here. And if you take the appropriate graded piece, you would get exactly the statement of the conjecture, the weak ordinarity conjecture. Um, so conjecture B is easily seen to imply weak ordinarity. Um, how do you go the other way? Well, you use a result of Mustatza and Srinivas, or at least a slight generalization of it. So if you recall what the weak ordinarity conjecture said, that was a statement about the Frobenius acting bijectively on the cohomology of a variety. And so here's the lemma. And Srinivas, and I guess also in the form we're stating it here, it's the, well, I'm technically going to state a small generalization of what they wrote down there. But basically, it says the following. If pi from y to x is a resolution of singularities, Maybe I should, how about pi from x prime to x is a resolution of singularities. And um, equal simple normal crossings. And if you want, you can think about it as the exceptional divisor, but some simple normal crossing guy on x prime on the resolution. Then, um, so this is simple normal crossings reduced. And I'll phrase it this way again. HIZ So again, I'm, I guess I'll start with X over C. I reduce it mod P as before. Yeah, please. I just realized that in weak ordinary conjecture, you have this X extension. That's right. Is X also here? No. It's probably singular, because it's Dubois. So why do you say X is X before? What is X? Oh, X is some variety. <laughs> just not smooth. <laughs> I, 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 the, the X A to A is as before. This is some exactly. reduction of characteristic P is as before. So, so, so X A over A is some 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 spreading out, you know, it, it's some family over some finely generated Z algebra, um, blah, blah, blah. Yes, so absolutely, you're right. X is definitely singular, so it's absolutely not smooth. Uh, Say finite type over C, yeah, that's fine. And so what this lemma says, and I, maybe I won't dwell on it too much, I'll just state it. Well, oops, XP. So 
I'm taking everything we had in characteristic zero, I'm reducing it to characteristic p again. And then the statement is assuming assuming weak ordinarity that this map right here actually injects for dense set of p in a, closed points in a. Um, so what's going on here? <sighs> Somehow you should think of, I mean, remember this EP was the guy that actually let us construct this hyper-resolution of the alternate definition set. And <clears throat> basically, I mean, so, so maybe I should say, so, so that's why it's relevant here, because you can fit um, this kind of thing um, into some kind, whoops, I wrote this all wrong. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. This is there should be r pi lower star in front of this guy too, and this should be O x p. There's no y prime because this this is an x. This is an x prime, so I need an r pi lower star. This map right here is for being in. And so, sort of roughly speaking, the idea is that um, These, the simple normal crossings E is made up of finitely many smooth components. And these finitely many smooth components intersect in various strata, which are also finitely many smooth things. And you run the weak ordinarity conjecture for all these guys simultaneously, and you can get, pick up this injection here. Um, and once you have this injection here, you actually get it on the r pi lower star of, of E by some, by some long exact sequences. And then the r pi lower star of EP This is what? Mm -hmm. Oh, OEP, yes, thank you. So if you assume that x was Dubois, which is the non-trivial part of this conjecture, or of this direction, that r pi lower star OEP is OXP. OK. And then you very quickly out of some long exact sequences that I won't write down due to time, you immediately get that Dubois implies f injective. And so this really basically follows out of the kind of lemma they were proving. They didn't quite phrase it this way, and they only did it for some i and not all i, but the, the same method works, and it gives you the same thing. Where does e, e is something is some kind of exceptional divisor. Think of it like an exceptional divisor on the resolution. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all right. Maybe I, I, okay. I had y in my notes. All x's turn into y. I'm not going to rewrite it. <laughs> so, 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 so what? Am I, I'm imagining x embeds in some smooth y. Sorry about that. No, uh, that's why I started to write y there. And, all right, all x's turned into y's. And E is, may, maybe E is the reduced preimage of X, some simple normal crossing. Okay. In, in y, this is smooth? y is assumed to be smooth. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, that's right. And then you write down some long exact sequences and everything sort of pops out. Okay. <clears throat> and so, um, so, so, so assume, if, if you take, given this lemma, it's not very hard to prove that Dubois implies the f-injective type by gluing together all of these ordinarity conjectures and all the sort of irreducible pieces of this EP. And, and it's various strata and lower, you know, lower co-dimensional strata. Okay, so that's half of what I wanted to talk about, and I still have half my time left, right? <laughs> no, I think I have eight minutes. So <laughs> um, let me talk about the other thing I wanted to talk about. So what, <clears throat> so what Mustatsa and Srinivas are actually using lemmas like this to prove was something a little bit it's kind of related to this kind of conjecture, but somehow philosophically a little bit different. Um, what they prove is I'll call this conjecture, let's see, what did I call 
I just erased, what was I calling it? Conjecture 2 or B or B. So I should call this one Conjecture 3? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I should use three Roman numerals? OK, C. Yeah, that's right. I'll just skip C. Oh, so I'll call this one C prime. Um, no, I have a reason, because I have one I'm going to call C in just a second. <laughs> Let's say X is smooth. Yeah, that's right. Um, D inside of X is um, some kind of subvariety. It actually reduces to the divisor case, so that's why I'm going to write it like D as a divisor. So, so I'm going to state another conjecture. Oh, what is it? Oh, um, this X is smooth over C. I live in Pennsylvania, though. Thanks for asking. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, X is smooth, D and X is some subvariety. D is probably singular. And you should think of it like a divisor because you can reduce to that case anyways. Then the statement is the multiplier ideal of X, T times D, you know, mod P, again, X over XA over A, some family as before. This guy equals something called the test ideal of X, P, T, D, P. For all t, so these are this is the coefficient of d, and for all um, and for a dense set of primes, or of of closed points, p inside a. So in fact, you choose the dense set of closed points before you have to choose any t. So you choose a dense set of closed points, and it works for all those t simultaneously. So I haven't told you what this is, and I'll tell you in just a second how to define this. This guy is some kind of analog of a multiplier ideal. And it was also defined completely independently of multiplier ideals. I guess multiplier ideals, at least in this kind of form, were, I mean, well, so certainly in the work of N.O. Fifeg, they sort of appeared. But in the analytic category, they appeared in the late 80s um, in Nadel's work. And test ideals also appeared in the late 80s in the commutative algebra world. So there's lots of parallels here. Um, <clears throat> what? It's an 80. It's an 80 it's, yes, it's, an, it's a notion that clearly showed up in the 80s. You can tell by the hairdo. Uh, OK, that's right. And so <clears throat> I'm going to remove this, the C prime just to save myself time here. And I'll just assume that x is Q Gorenstein over C. And this is conjecture C. And so so what the theorem that Mustata and Srinivas proved, Mustata and Srinivas, is they showed that conjecture C prime was equivalent to weak ordinarity. And the theorem that we proved is that is a, is a slight generalization of this. No, but I've uh, yeah I, I've written a lot of papers with Manuel. So when I start to write B, <laughs> I just assume. Yeah. <laughs> um, is that conjecture C? is equivalent to weak ordinarity. So conjecture C is a slightly stronger conjecture, which applies to some kind of Q Gorenstein. You can also phrase it with a log Q Gorenstein base, you know, if you fix a, fix a divisor um, on the base too. Um, <clears throat> and so in the last two minutes, let me briefly describe maybe the difference in the proof here. Um, and then maybe I'll say a very quick word about what, what, how to define this guy, and then maybe I'll stop. So somehow, the point in this conjecture is they're going to use this lemma up there again. And what they first do is they do some kind of semi-stable reduction so, so that you can, or you know, so, so some kind of finite cover of your variety. Maybe I'll call it, um, I don't know, x1 to x, so that the reduced preimage of, of, your, of your d is a reduced, or sorry, so, so that the, 
the pullback of D is some kind of reduced simple normal crossings divisor instead of just a normal crossings divisor that might not be reduced. So you're, I'm going to choose some kind of resolution here, um, x1 prime. And so the idea is, you know, you, you want to pull back this guy to be reduced so they can apply that lemon. They use some kind of semi-stable reduction to do that. And as far as I understand, that's, that's why you guys really needed the smoothness hypothesis right here. Um, <clears throat> and so what we do is a little bit different. We also use a, a variant of this lemma in exactly the same way. But what we do somehow is we, I, I don't really have time to get into the proof, but sort of we rely on the fact that um, the multiplier ideal of x t minus epsilon d that this is the push forward from a resolution ox prime to x, kx prime minus the pullback of kx plus t d. I mean, this would be the multiplier ideal without the minus epsilon there, maybe with round ups. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract off the reduced preimage of, or I, maybe I'll add back in the reduced preimage of d. So the point is, instead of, I mean, instead of doing the t minus, dealing with t minus epsilon, notice I can write t minus epsilon as the pullback of d, at, at, at least if t is, an, t is an integer, which is another case you can reduce to. You can reduce, you can basically think of it as subtracting off, subtracting off epsilon is like subtracting off one from each component if d is an integral divisor. And somehow this turns out to be the key point for us to make this kind of thing work. Um, and yeah, I mean, so some, and then we can somehow apply their lemma again to this pi upper star d reduced in some way and chase a bunch of diagrams around and things work out. And so I don't have time to say much more about the proof than that. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll say one very quick thing about the definition of this test ideal, just because I feel like I should say something about how it's defined, especially because Paolo spent all this time defining all these trace maps yesterday. Um, and then I'll, okay, all right, I'll be very quick. And so roughly speaking, this is in characteristic P, this tau x, maybe TD, is equal to the following sum. It's just an images, it's just a sum of images of these trace maps. So maybe I'll say E is sufficiently big. Um, <clears throat> trace of OX 1 minus P to the E, KX, and then it's exactly the same thing that Paolo was writing down, minus P to the E minus 1 T D, and then minus some other fixed divisor. You can sort of think of it like the kind of thing you might perturb by when studying the like diminished base locus or something. Um, or I'm sorry, the augmented base locus. It's like some kind of subtracting off some small thing to make it somehow stabilize better. And it's, so as long as it's sufficiently big or vanishes on the right parts, it, it's fine to take anything bigger than that. And so it's really just a bunch of images of these trace maps. And I think I'll stop here. Yes. Yes. Do you think that, I mean, do you have some idea of attacking one of them? Um, I don't think I have any good ideas on attacking, on attacking any of them. <laughs> um, I mean, I think uh, there are a number of people, especially sort of on the commutative algebra side, trying to do a bunch of cases of things. Um, you know, so, so, so let's say you have various varieties of, of a certain form, say smooth varieties of a certain form, maybe hypersurface, maybe not. And then they, they just say, okay, let's say the, these equations are in this certain form. Let's prove, let's prove that all of these guys satisfy this kind of thing. And so there are certainly a lot number of people doing this kind of stuff. But I mean, the only thing you can get out of special cases is special cases. You know, so you only get varieties of a certain form. Although they actually seem to think that a lot of varieties of a, you know, this is actually going to cover a fair 
number of things in the end. I, at least I think that's hope, hopeful, but you know, certainly not, not everything. Um, and I don't have any good ideas for attacking it. Do you have any good ideas for attacking this conjecture? <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll give you till this afternoon then. Yes. Oh, I see. I, I'm not. Oh, yeah, you, I, I'm not relating a multiplier ideal in Dubois, except there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. That's also equivalent. The log canonical conjecture is also equivalent. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, uh, that didn't. Uh, why? Mm, the s same kind of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all all these conjectures are. <sighs> well. That's right. That's true. But but but, but, but you can take yeah, cover canonical covers and. Yeah, yeah. C, this is C. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 I think all these, these, all these things are, are going to be equivalent, but yeah, I don't know what else. I mean, but let's see. Definitely, definitely this can, let me, let me think. Maybe I'm, I'm not sure if the log, so some, it's possible that the Dubois conjecture is stronger than the log canonical one. So I was thinking that definitely, definitely the the weak ordinarity implies the log canonical f pure conjecture. And I'm, and I'm trying to think if log canonical f pure log canonical f pure would definitely imply the weak ordinarity conjecture in the Clavier case, but I'm not quite sure if it would apply it in the. What? You don't think it implies a full one? Okay, so that's probably right. But so 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 so, so the log canonical f pure conjecture seems I think is potentially weaker than the Dubois F injective one. So it, it's not quite the same, but this one is the same, amazingly enough. <laughs> I'm over, I mean, okay. The, the, there's a way, actually there's a way to actually phrase like log there's a way to phrase multipl uh, Dubois-ness in terms of multiplier ideal type statements and I, how about I tell you this after okay. Okay. any is there a 